In the 1980s, high tech was all the rage, and the automotive companies that were selling vehicles in the United States tried to certainly put a good level of technology into a number of vehicles that they sold. Some cars in the 1980s just had the tech under hood and in the chassis, but others brought that high tech feel into the interiors. And the 1980s perhaps saw some of the strangest, funkiest, coolest high tech dashboards and instrument panels that were ever on display or employed in automotive history. In this video, we're going to examine the top 10, at least in my opinion, high tech dashboards and instrument panels that were produced in the 1980s for vehicles sold in the United States. If I forget one, be sure to put it in the comments section. But I hope you enjoy this list. At number 10, we have a car whose importance cannot be understated, and that is the 1986 Ford Taurus and Mercury Sable. When Ford introduced these vehicles in 1986, they were like nothing else that was being produced by the domestic auto company. Both GM and Chrysler were still producing relatively boxy vehicles that were made in the vein of the 1976-79 Cadillac Seville. That car had been so popular and so successful that it really had set the tone for automotive styling until the Taurus and Sable came out. And when the Taurus and Sable came out, they set the auto industry in a whole new direction. My personal favorite is the Mercury Sable with the light bar front end, as you can see here, as well as the skirted rear fender. On the inside, the Taurus and Sable also had a rather high-tech interior, or at least you could option up to one. They had a standard, we'll call it a regular instrument gauge cluster, but you could get an optional electronic cluster in your Taurus and Sable. You can see here in this page from the 1986 Taurus brochure, Ford called this the Taurus Command Center and noticed that it has a digital speedometer as well as a digital RPM gauge, automatic climate control, a clock, a, an electronic radio, and a diagnostic center there off to the left. The fuel and temperature gauges were standard analog fare. But other than that, this particular instrument cluster had a number of high-tech features associated with it that when you got behind the wheel, gave you the sense that you were piloting something that was, well, a revolutionary car for the time, and the Taurus or the Sable, no matter which one you chose, really was. Let's move on to number nine. And in the number nine spot, we have perhaps an appropriate vehicle, the 1988 Lincoln Continental. And I say appropriate because the 1988 Continental, which was the eighth generation Continental produced from 1988 to 1994, was based on the Taurus and Sable platform. The 1988 Continental replaced the 1982 to 1987 seventh generation Continental that had that bustle back like styling. And by 1988, Ford was looking for something more fresh to sell the buying public. And they came out with this overall sleek looking design that was actually the largest front wheel drive car sold in America in 1988. And while the Continental on the outside was certainly a good looker for a luxury vehicle, it was on the inside where the Continental took a bit different approach, but one that was a natural evolution of the high-tech 1982-87 to Continental interior. For 1988, the Lincoln Continental interior had a number of high-tech features, but it was an interesting mix of high-tech in terms of the controls and the instrument panel, and then old-school comfort, as you can see here with these velour seats. First, take a look at the switch gear on the door panel. You'll notice in addition to the window and mirror controls, there are also seat controls that are formed in the shape of the seat, similar to what Mercedes was doing, as well as a memory seat function. So the door panel had a lot of features to it, as well as a matte pocket and a large speaker grill. The dash and doors had these beautiful wood tones, but as you can see here, the instrument panel had a full complement of digital gauges. Well, full is perhaps an overstatement. But you can see here that there was an electronic speedometer, odometer, a message center, which included a trip computer, and of course your temperature and fuel gauge were also electronic. The car did have electronic climate control as well. And if you wanted, you could toggle that gauge on the left there. It's set to oil pressure in this particular view to being a temperature gauge or a battery voltage gauge by hitting the gauges select button at the top left. So overall, the 1988 Continental really introduced the next generation of technology into its interiors from what was indeed a high-tech interior, the 1982 to 87 Continental. And the car was a sales success. It actually ended up selling in 1988 about double the volume that the 1987 Continental did.
Let's now move on to number eight, where we have the 1981 Imperial by Chrysler. Bustleback styling was all the rage in the early 1980s as the 1980 Cadillac Seville set a new styling trend similar to what the 76 to 79 Seville set, but at least this styling trend really was confined to luxury cars. And the 1981 Imperial was Chrysler's Bustleback and a handsome one at that. It was a beautifully styled vehicle and one that was also supposed to have a lot of high tech in it, and it did. Unfortunately, some of the high tech worked well, and some of it, like the underhood electronic fuel injection system, did not. By the way, don't let anyone try to convince you that the electronic fuel injection system in these cars is very good because knowing a number of Chrysler engineers that worked on the system, all of whom say that it was very, very poor and rushed to market, I can tell you that it's not. In any event, let's turn to the interior of the 1981 Imperial and talk about it a little bit. The 1981 Imperial had this high-tech digital instrument cluster. Where you can see you had a digital speedometer, odometer, clock, as well as a trip computer. The trip computer was controlled by that row of buttons atop the center console. You did also have warning lights for various doors being ajar there at the bottom left of the instrument cluster and a fully electronic radio that you can see at the right that actually produced a beautiful sound. Beneath the radio is the HVAC control, which was a gussied up version of the semi-automatic system employed in the Aspen Velari, and then the M bodies would also have that too. It was a cool interior and it gave the driver a sense that they were sitting in a very high tech machine and they were to some degree for the time. As I mentioned, these cars had a high tech and not so functional electronic fuel injection system, but a lot of the underlying parts were very vintage Chrysler, including the transverse torsion bar front suspension and rear leaf springs. Yes, even the Imperial still had rear leaf springs on the 1981 to 83 versions. And while these vehicles were a bit troublesome, they were certainly beautiful and overall good driving cars, although the 318 under hood definitely did not have all that much power, as was the case with almost any Malays era vehicle that was sold during this time frame. Side note, if you see an asterisk in the odometer, like you see on this vehicle, that means that the instrument cluster has been replaced, which is pretty typical, especially on the cars that had a dealer carburetor conversion kit installed in them, which was a very frequent occurrence given, as I said, the EFI systems were problematic and Chrysler recalled all those systems and their owners could bring them in for free and have them retrofitted to have a two-barrel carburetor atop the 318 V8. Let's move on to number seven, where we'll have another Chrysler vehicle. Well, really a series of Chrysler vehicles. Those Chryslers that were outfitted with the electronic voice alert system, and perhaps most specifically the Chrysler New Yorkers of this era that were based on the K car. Chrysler introduced its electronic voice alert system, as I mentioned, in 1983, and it could be included on a number of Chryslers, everything from the LeBarons, the Town & Country Wagons, the Fifth Avenues, New Yorkers, the Laser in Daytona, and even the Dodge 600, and was offered from 1983 to 1988 when it was killed off. The New Yorker of these vehicles that I mentioned perhaps has the most luxurious interior, and you can see it here. It has sumptuous button-tufted seats and also a highly electronic instrument cluster befitting that high-tech feel that Chrysler was going for on these vehicles. You can see that there was a digital instrument cluster as well as radio on these vehicles, but it was that electronic voice alert that gave them that extra high-tech touch that actually annoyed a number of customers. Perhaps the most humorous element of the electronic voice alert is that when you would open the door while the car was running, it would say, your door is a jar. And of course, people would say, well, a door is not a jar, it's a door. But that was the terminology that Chrysler selected for the electronic voice alert. As I mentioned, the EVA would be killed off by Chrysler in 1988, doomed by its high cost as well as annoyance to a lot of the buying public. Here, I sit down with Maximum Bob, Bob Lutz, to talk specifically about Chrysler's EVA and why he was the one who elected to kill it off. Talking car. That was another one of my favorites at Chrysler. Uh, first of all, the digital instrument displays. Your door is a jar. Yeah, Your door. <laughs> early, early digital, which I, I remember that the, at Chrysler. The, the, I think the British called it, no, the Germans called them mouse movies. So if you had really? mice in your car, they could all sit on this steering wheel rim and watch, and watch the videos. Uh, but that was four hundred dollars a car, plus about another hundred and fifty for talking car. And 
And meanwhile, the, the K cars and their derivatives could stand a lot of additional goodness, like um, uh, noise vibration and harshness, it's, uh, it fixes and so forth. And you're 650 bucks into something that people absolutely hated and did no good whatsoever. So, you know, I was the guy, I took out talking car, took out the digital instrument display, put in BMW style instruments, um, you know, big tack and speedometer with four little subsidiary instruments. Everybody liked it better and nobody had to re be, nobody needed a voice reminder that their car door was open. And there you have it from Maximum Bob himself. Let's move on to number six and switch to General Motors where we talk about the 1986 Buick Riviera. Buick designers had a hard act to follow in developing the 1986 Riviera, particularly after the 1979 to 1985 model's success. And coupled with the fact that program planners mandated that the 1986 Riviera, as well as its sibling Tornado, El Dorado, and Seville, would be placed on a very, very small platform. So Buick tried to go high-tech with the 1986 Riviera and have it appeal to younger, more affluent buyers. The styling conveyed this externally, but really it was the interior that took this theme to a new level, as you can see here. The 86 Riviera not only had a digital dash with digital fuel gauge and speedometer and trip odometer, as well as a unique steering wheel that was exclusive to the Riviera and some novel switch gear, but it also ushered in one of the most hated features of the time, and that was the Buick CRT Graphic Control Center that you can see there in the middle of the center stack. And despite it being loathed by many in the buying public at the time, this actually foreshadowed what we have on cars today, so I suppose it was just 35 years ahead of its time. The GCC allowed the driver to control everything from climate control to the radio to providing various gauges, a trip monitor, and diagnostics. You can see here these little chiclet style buttons that you had to push in order to activate the volume going up or down, seeking the signal on the radio, changing the temperature. And this was really what was hated by many buyers. You can imagine trying to push your finger on that relatively small button as you're going over a bumpy surface. But as I said, this is something that's very similar to what's on vehicles today. And we kind of now just accept it. But back then, many people wanted the old school knobs and dials that they didn't have to take their eyes off the road to activate, which makes sense overall. And by the way, that's still one of the complaints that many have about these electronic systems in cars today, and it hasn't yet been resolved. Nonetheless, the 1986 Riviera certainly had this high-tech dash. It would only last for a few years before the CRT would go away. It also was a bit trouble prone. So General Motors axed it and it was banished to history. At number five, we have the platform mate to the Riviera that was just mentioned, the 1989 Oldsmobile Tornado Trofeo. In 1987, Oldsmobile introduced the Trofeo as an upper sporty luxury trim on the Tornado. And by 1989, the Trofeo got something that was even more unique than what it had originally. The Trofeo always had this really high-tech instrument cluster, but in 1989, it also received Oldsmobile's Visual Information Center. When coupled with the already high-tech instrument cluster that you can see here that was part of the Trofeo since its inception, the Visual Information Center was kind of like Oldsmobile's graphic control center for Buick, although Oldsmobile was a bit smarter than Buick in that it put redundant controls that you can see there to the left of the Visual Information Center. I do love this high-tech dash for a number of reasons, aside from the Visual Information Center, one of which is the steering wheel buttons that are included. I think Oldsmobile was stealing that idea from Pontiac at the time. And also that cool sliding bar RPM gauge that's underneath the speedometer. Here's an advertisement for the 1989 Tornado, and you can see Oldsmobile is talking about all the different functions of the Visual Information Center. Everything from controlling your radio to climate control to telling you a door is, of course, a jar, not a door. Also, it even had an oil life monitor built in as well as a headlamp monitor to tell you if one of your headlamps was burned out. It even had a very primitive compass and it was not that great of a compass. But this Visual Information Center was certainly high tech in 
and perhaps even too high tech for the buyers. Remember that these were buyers that previously were buying a 79 to 85 Tornado coming back off lease and looking at this extremely small vehicle and wondering what happened to the car that I drove and why has it been cut down by two feet? Well, the 1986 Tornado and by 1989, this Tornado Trofeo just didn't resonate with the buying public and Oldsmobile had to expand the car in 1990 in an attempt to make it look a little bit bigger and have more presence than what it did. The same was true for the platform mates like the Riviera in that same model year. Let's move back to the Ford Motor Company and tackle number four, which is the 1982 Lincoln Continental. The 1982 Lincoln Continental, as I was mentioning when I was talking about the Imperial, was cut in the vein of the 1980 Seville and this overall bustle back styling. But the 1982 Continental, while relatively conventional from the front and perhaps atypical from the rear, really blazed a new pathway in terms of its high-tech interior. Designers laid out this beautifully handsome instrument panel that was hooded over top, interestingly a bit similar to the 79-85 Eldorado and 80-85 Seville instrument panel, but underneath that hooded brow was a fully digital instrument cluster and trip computer that came alive when you turned the key on. And you can see here from this illuminated instrument cluster that there was, as I mentioned, a full digital speedometer. There was also a very, very sophisticated trip computer that was atop the center stack there with a number of features that allowed you to see the distance travel, fuel economy, time to destination, and other elements, and an electronic radio. And the climate control was strangely placed in the bottom section there, I guess, Ford was thinking that you wouldn't really change it once you set the overall temperature. But the 1982 Continental really had a seminal dash in that, as I said, it didn't come alive until you turned the key on. And it really was one of the first domestic auto companies to have this dash where it was completely dark with the key off. And that would be a theme that a number of other automakers would employ in their vehicles, including even Lexus on the original LS400, where the gauges were totally dead until you turned the key on. So it did set a number of design trends, and for that reason, it makes this list. And number five, we're going to switch to Japan, because they certainly made some funky cars as well and interiors, and talk about the 1985 Subaru XT5. Subaru was looking to introduce a more sporty vehicle to kind of help its image in the United States, and... Japan as well. And consequently, they introduced this XT for 1985. The car had a very low sloping hood with hidden headlights, and as was typical of GM design at the time, a lower belt line than the hood line you can see here in this front three quarter view. But it was on the inside where the Subaru XT had this crazy dash in a number of versions that you can see here. For not only did you get a digital dash, we're going to talk more about the actual speedometer and RPM gauge in a second, but you got these arrays of buttons and controls that were mounted to the steering column that moved as you tilted the column up and down, enabled you to control a number of features on the interior. You also got a super funky two-spoke L-shaped steering wheel something that I haven't really seen on any other cars. Other cars have two-spoke wheels, but not in this exact shape. Incidentally, those buttons on the steering wheel are for the cruise control. And then, of course, on the pods, you have controls for the headlamps as well as the climate control and the wiper controls. Now, as we switch to the instrument cluster, we have one of the coolest ones that I think was ever produced. And that's because you have this very strange horizon, I guess, style. RPM gauge on the left and turbo gauge on the right in this case for the Turbo XT5. And of course you have a digital RPM counter there at the top left and a speedometer at the top right. But I've never really seen another instrument cluster that has this kind of horizon and then the RPM gauge shooting out from the horizon or the turbo gauge doing the same. It's a super, super cool feature and wonky and makes the Subaru XT5 one of the items on the top of this list. And there also was an indicator to show you when the four-wheel drive setup was engaged or the road leveling system. So it was a cool, cool car that uh, had, well, let's just say an interesting and high-tech gauge cluster for sure. Let's now move back to the domestic auto companies and the Pontiac 6000 STE. The Pontiac 6000 was Pontiac's version of General Motors A-platform vehicles, 
which encompassed the 6000 as well as the Chevrolet Celebrity, Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra, and Buick Century. By 1983, Pontiac was trying to get a little bit more excitement in the brand and, as a consequence, introduced the 6000 STE, or Special Touring Edition. It was a five-passenger car that had captain seats up front as well as standard power windows, complete with a center console. And in 1983, it also had a pretty high-tech dash. Now, as the 6000 evolved in 1984, it got a digital instrument cluster with this rising bar RPM gauge that is pretty sweet. And then later, we get steering wheel controls as well. These steering wheel controls would perhaps be the first implementation of something like this in a domestic auto car. And... It endowed the 6000 STE with myriad buttons that the driver could just delight himself or herself with while they were piloting their 6000 STE down the road. The 6000 STE dash perhaps looked best at night. We had this combination of the Pontiac orange coupled with green lighting, and it just made you feel like you were sitting in an airplane cockpit, especially, as I said, at night. The 6000 STE was also a pretty gosh darn cool car. In 1988, an all-wheel drive system would be introduced as an option, something that you weren't necessarily expecting to see in a General Motors A car, but you could get. And now we move on to number one. And I'm going to chicken out here because I could not pick which of these was the coolest high-tech dash of the 1980s. So you're going to have to vote and vote in the comments section. That is a choice between the 1984 Camaro Berlinetta and the 1984 Nissan 300 ZX. Let's start by talking about the Berlinetta. The Camaro Berlinetta was supposed to be the luxury version of the Camaro and was introduced a few years earlier on the previous generation Camaro as a successor to the Type LT. And it was generally the car that most female buyers were angling for. But in 1984, Chevrolet redesigned the Berlinetta's instrument panel to give it a specific instrument cluster only for the Berlinetta. This was not employed in any other Camaro. And as you can see here, it had everything from these pods that controlled the lights and wipers and HVAC to a digital speedometer to a digital RPM gauge. There was a bar graph that went up vertically as the RPMs increase, to a swivel pod radio. You even got some interesting features on the Berlinetta like a swivel map light and a map pocket in the overhead console and a little thumb wheel calendar, trip computer, date reminder that was in the overhead console as well. I think the funkiest part of the interior was the swivel pod radio that had the clock as well as the radio functions up top and then the cassette player on the bottom and it was a good idea, except that it kind of chattered as you were going over bumps and made squeaking noises. But the swivel prod radio somehow would also make its way into the 1985 Buick Somerset because, of course, it had to have a swivel pod radio there. In any event, the Camaro Berlinetta had one of the funkiest interiors ever put in an automobile, at least in my opinion. It was just hard to pick between this and the Nissan 300ZX, which I'll now talk about, that also has a crazy interior. The spiritual successor to the original Z, the 300ZX, introduced in 1984 this crazy wonky digital cluster that you can see here behind the two-spoke wheel. And it had digital fuel gauges, temperature gauges, oil pressure gauges, kind of the standard fare. But the coolest feature about it was this rising bar RPM tachometer that would visually rise as the engine's revs increased. I've never seen, again, something like this before or since, and it was just visual theater to complement the other digital gauges. The other cool thing about the 300ZX is that, similar to Chrysler's electronic voice alert, this car had Nissan's voice alert system that would alert you to a number of warnings, but it did so in a different manner than the Chrysler. More specifically, this Nissan had a little mini record player where a female voice would tell you one of these warnings and it was literally a little phonograph that would make these noises, and you can see it here. So for that reason, I really just can't pick between the Camaro Berlinetta and the Nissan 300ZX. You're going to have to do it for me. Let me know in the comments section. But I hope you enjoyed this special and spotlight on high-tech interiors of the 1980s. Thanks again for watching.